आई वी एम टेक अ लुक एट योर स्मार्ट फोन यू माई थिंक दैट मोस्ट ऑफ इट्स टेक्नोलॉजी वॉज बिल्ट बाय द लाइक्स ऑफ एपल गूगल और सैमसंग but in fact they only bundled government developed technologies into a single package the underlying technology that makes your smartphone smart was developed with government funding including the internet gps hard drives touch screens and voice activated virtual assistants after government's funded all of this technology development private industry was able to package them into the supercomputers in our pockets that we now can't do without and the benefits don't stop there by funding research government strain workforces which are absolutely crucial to the commercialization of these technologies the students and postdocs and professors that work in these government funded research labs go on to join industry or start research labs of their own and continue the cycle of training simultaneously those private industry players whether they are startups visionary investors and venture capitalists or large corporations like apple and samsung take the ball and run with it It's a synergistic continuous cycle of technology transfer and innovation and it seems long arduous and difficult to predict but if you zoom out you see something beautiful progress this interplay between talent capital and the support of governments is absolutely essential to humans flourishing and in some parts of the world progress happens faster than others when it comes to technology over the last decades some cities or geographical regions have seemed to dominate San Francisco or the Bay Area with all of the tech innovation dating back to the semiconductor Boston or more accurately Cambridge with its wonderful universities and biotech innovation and of course India's Bangalore and Hyderabad tech titans in their own right as we try to chart a path forward for the alternative protein sector beyond the well trodden paths in technology bastions such as the Bay Area it's worth remembering the key ingredients of these innovation ecosystems Today's guest can speak cogently to those ingredients. He's variously a biohacker, a tech visionary and revolutionary, an entrepreneur, an investor, and a champion of a better future across the board. Ryan Bethencourt is CEO of Wild Earth that makes pet food from fermentation-based protein. He's also a partner at Babel Ventures, an early-stage consumer biotech venture capital fund. Ryan's resume as an investor runs long. He was the co-founder of Indie Bio, an SOSV-backed accelerator and early-stage seed fund that is the leading global biotech accelerator. And he also was CEO and co-founder at Berkeley Bio Labs, a startup incubator and sector builder. He was also previously the head of life sciences at the X Prize Foundation. And in short, Ryan is probably one of the most prodigious funders in alternative protein. Of the 130 companies he has backed in the last decade, the list famously includes Shiok Meats. Memphis Meats, New Way Foods, Clara Foods, Finless Foods, as well as Mumbai-based plant-based egg company Evo Foods. Ryan has a master's in bioscience enterprise from Cambridge University. As a faculty member at Singularity University, he teaches biotech and the future of food. Ryan's aim is to positively impact the lives of billions of people and animals through applied biotechnology. I'm Varun Deshpande, managing director at the Good Food Institute India. And I'm Ramya Ramurthy, the communication specialist at the Good Food Institute India, and you are listening to Feeding Ten Billion. So, Ryan, welcome to our show. Thank you, Ramya. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So, we like to start things off on this show by talking about how our guests got from point A to point B. For you, you're someone with a biosciences background. You went to university in Warwick and Cambridge. You were enrolled for a PhD in stem cell differentiation in Edinburgh. How did you pivot from academia and embrace biohacking and the startup founder investor path? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, and I hope this is useful for I think many of your listeners who are trying to find their path in the world. I think that in retrospect, things always seem to make sense, but looking forward, you know, if I go back to that my early twenties, late teens, and and just the journey that I went through. I loved science growing up. I grew up reading science fiction. I was fascinated by science. I loved science. I just had one challenge, which was that you know I thought that I really wanted to be a bench scientist. That I thought I really wanted to do research at the university. You know, the dream of ivory towers is always like this beautiful dream of academia. And I started my PhD at Edinburgh. I'd, I'd done my previous two degrees: my bachelor's degree, my master's degree. My master's was at Cambridge, which was a fusion of the biotech course and the, the business course at Cambridge. And 
all of a sudden I felt like I was moving in slow motion. And so I was like, wait a minute, is this what academic research is? I'm here, I'm going to spend years trying to answer one question within science. And however much I loved a lot of the research that I read and that I'd done up until that point, I realized that I was too impatient to spend years trying to answer one question. I wanted to accelerate everything across the board and I wanted to build things and I wanted to build things quickly. And I was very impatient. And so honestly, you know, when I dropped out of my PhD at Edinburgh, I was pretty disappointed in myself. I was like, well, I'm not cut out to be a scientist. I'm too impatient. You know, I love science. I love reading the research papers. I love talking about the science. I love problem solving. But when it comes to being, you know, doing the actual bench work, I was too impatient. So I had a challenge. And my challenge was, how do I move forward in the world if I love science? I love helping science. I love supporting science. I love being involved in science, but I'm not the right person. And everyone I'd talked to within academia basically told me, well, if you don't do science, if you're not a science researcher, or a PhD scientist, you can't do anything in the world of science. This was the dawn of you know, regenerative medicine, stem cells, like just such an exciting time within science. And so I was pretty disappointed. I was like, I guess I'm done. And then I just started to ask various people, I was like, what should I do with my life? I actually had one mentor originally from Cambridge when I was at Cambridge. And he told me, he was like, well, you have to choose. If you wanted to be head of a lab or you wanted to be a chief scientific officer, you should have continued your PhD. But if you want to build biotech companies, which is you know what my passion was, I was fascinated by business and biotech, you have to start. And so I was like, how do I start? And that basically, that question, how do I start, has taken me the last roughly two decades to really start figuring that out. I started working for a pharmaceutical company. Uh, I started in sales. So I was actually very, I was able to go very deep and I started to really learn the medicine and science deeply so I could speak with doctors and sell to doctors. And then gradually I went up from being a primary care sales rep to being a specialty care sales rep and I was selling to specialty doctors and then eventually selling to hospitals. And then eventually I started to work for clinical research companies. And then eventually I headed up business development for those clinical research companies. And I helped develop from phase one, two, and three human clinical studies, develop new therapeutics from everything from cancer to Alzheimer's disease and various other things that we worked in. And so I realized that there was a path for me, which was this interface between business and science. And, you know, I found myself in 2008 in California, and the entire biotech industry started to die. It was the Great Recession. The biotech industry started to die. And at the time, I was one of the few people that I knew that was really in the interface between the business world and the science world and really loved science. And the headlines at the time, and I still have, I guess, cuttings, but like digital cuttings of, of the newspapers at the time, they said, biotech is dead, the end of biotechnology, 2008, right? We're in 2020 today. And I was like, that's just not possible. That's just not possible. This is the era of biotechnology. And so that led me to start buying used lab equipment from bankrupt biotech companies. Myself and several of my friends, we started to build home labs in our living rooms, in our garages, in shared community labs. Eventually that went on to what's be called biohacking. And then I started to build more labs. And then I built a for-profit lab with some friends, Ron Shigeta, my, my co-founder at Berkeley Biolabs. And then I co-founded Indie Bio with Ron Shigeta, Arvind Gupta, and Sean O'Sullivan, the SOS and SOSV. And the mission was simple, to help scientists become entrepreneurs. And by that point, I'd become really adept at business, and I was pretty deep in terms of biotechnology. I could hold my own with pretty much any chief scientific officer or medical doctor. And then that kind of unleashed my path. And since then, I've been building biotech companies for the last, nearly last decade. Not quite, but nearly last decade. So I guess what you're saying, Ryan, is that, you know, if plan A doesn't work out, just abandon everything. <laughs> That's right. And then see where you end up, right? I mean, honestly, Varun, I think that is, I think that is the path, right? I think the path is to get lost sometimes and to find your way. And I think that's the most interesting and powerful careers, I think, start in that way. You know, Ryan, I've known you for some time now, and we've always talked about building ecosystems and thinking through, mm -hmm. you know, how biology is changing everything, how biology is becoming programmable, and, you know, what might happen in India and how it mirrors what happened in the U.S. and a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever told you that I had somewhat abortive college career as well, which was actually the initial desire was to go in and become a chemical and biomedical engineer and to do research. 
and perhaps consider going into drug development or genetic engineering and things like that. Except I, I actually aborted my college career in undergrad, not in a PhD program, but I, I was oh, doing wow, it. I did not know that. In undergrad, you aborted the guy. That's some of the most successful founders and innovators do exactly that. Yeah, so I mean, I uh, well, I hope it turns out that way for me. Uh, it, it's going pretty well thus far with GFI. I think one of the things that I didn't tell you was I was actually a cell culture intern as well in undergrad. Uh, so I spent a couple of summers doing uh, do, doing cell culture for these projects. And I thought, there is no way I'm spending my career doing this. I don't feel like I'm particularly good at it relative to the general person. And I couldn't see a path forward. So I, I totally resonate with what you're saying. I don't think I gave myself a chance to dive as deep as you did. But I think a lot of this goes towards the idea of when great talent or when someone that really has deep sense of mission meets the right problem. And I think that that's kind of what is going to be needed at the forefront of technology, right? And that's been the case ever since you've been doing this stuff in 2008. So, I, I mean, yeah. I wanted to ask you, like, if you look at some of the companies you've invested in, uh, I think you're possibly one of the most prolific biotech investors in the world. I mean, you funded and built over 70 biotech companies in the last 10, 12 years. I mean, we're looking at through IndieBio, XPRIZE Foundation, Berkeley Bio Labs, a list that includes Memphis Meats, New Wave Foods, Clara Foods, Finless Foods, among many others. These companies have raised a lot of money and are really uh, changing the world as we speak. So I think everyone would want to know from an investment standpoint and a really a company building and a partnership standpoint, what are you looking to back in people? What are you looking for from a founding team at the forefront of technology? So maybe I'll, I'll take it in two pieces. So one is my philosophy around this, like why have I done what I've done? And by the way, I think my current count now is somewhere between 120 and 130 companies. You know, over the last three years, I joined Babel Ventures and we invested in a whole bunch of consumer biotech companies as well and advised, actually personally, angel invested in several companies, including Shiok Meats. I was the first uh, angel investor with actually my co-angel investors in Shiok Meats, mm. actually Evo Foods in India, and also most recently a company called Veggie Victory, which is the first Nigerian plant-based meat company which I'm super excited about. Hakim yep. is based in Lagos in Nigeria. Yep. And so I'm almost always looking for, you know, the underdogs, the dark horses, usually the people that are there, they're going to do it regardless. They're so driven that this is a personal mission for them. And regardless of what it is, I mean, most of the companies that we've talked about is really future of food, but really I view myself as someone who likes to help innovators. I either become the innovator or I work with the innovators to accelerate the future of food and the future of biotechnology as well. I'm very passionate about all sorts of areas from human longevity all the way through to regenerative medicine for humans and biomaterials using DNA as a storage material. I backed a company called Catalog Technologies, which stores digital data and DNA. It's about a million times more data dense than a hard drive that we're currently using right now. So I think that, you know, I am a student of the universe and a student of biology. And so I'm looking for other people that are like that. I'm looking for people that, for them, this is not about starting a company to make a bunch of money. I think, you know, certain founders understand the nature of our existence, right? We are here for a short period of time. I view both biology and the act of creation, whether it's a company or a nonprofit or just some sort of innovation, you know, as a spiritual practice. And so we're here for a short period of time. Human lives are finite. We die. And so during the period of time that we're here, what is the positive impact we can make for the world and for our fellow humans and for the animals and for the planet? And that's what I'm looking for in founders that I back. I want someone who really understands that this is a mission, this is a moment of time where we can make a really outsized positive impact. And then separately, they have to have a technical competence. So typically it's a team of co-founders. So you'll have one business lead and one science lead. Both of them have to have some level of experience. They don't have to have built a company before, but if you're a business lead, why are you passionate about building business? Are you willing to literally spend your morning, nights, evening, weekends, shower while you're taking a shower, your brain's thinking about business? Are you willing to do that? If the answer is yes, then I think you're the type of missionary that I'm looking for. And the same thing for the scientists and the technical people that I back. Is your mind going to be working on problems and solving them 24 hours, seven days a week when you're not sleeping. And sometimes, by the way, when you are sleeping, Kerry Mullis is famous for coming up with uh, PCR, actually not while he was sleeping, apparently when he was tripping out on drugs and partially sleep. So, you know, like these are the type of people that I'm looking for, people that eventually become unstoppable because it's much more than just building a business. It's a mission to transform the world for the better. 
So Ryan, you're a proud pet parent and Varun is as well. And with Wild Earth, you're applying biohacking to dog food to offer fermentation-based protein products for pets in the US and hopefully beyond as well. Can you tell mm-hmm. us how this may transform the $30 billion pet food industry and why it's important from an animal welfare or a sustainability point of view? In fact, in one of our panels at the Future of Protein Summit that we organized last year, Vikas Garg of A Billion Wedge mentioned that the American dog is apparently the fifth largest consumer of meat in the world. So how ripe is this sector for a shakeup? It's a massive sector that's ripe for a shakeup. So both Varun and I for sure connect with our dogs. We both... Uh, Dog dads, you know, we both love animals as well. Really, it's a mission for me. As an animal lover, I started looking at pet food and I kept wondering, you know, who is making better food for our pets, for our dogs, and eventually for our cats as well. And I just couldn't see it. I didn't see any company. There was no Beyond Meat. There was no Impossible Foods. There was no Memphis Meats of pet food. And I actually tried to give the idea away. I was like, look, I'm a human therapeutics guy. I'm a food guy. I'm not a pet food guy. And I tried to give it away to multiple founders. And actually the founders, basically, they, they wanted to do something else that wasn't their mission. And so I was like, well, if not me, then who? And the deeper I researched the pet food industry, actually the global pet food industry, the more I realized it was a totally broken and rotten system. And when I mean broken and rotten, America's dogs and cats, if they were a country, they would be the fifth largest consumer of meat on the planet. That's in the U.S. at the moment. We have about somewhere about 180 to 190 million dogs and cats just in the U.S. Both China and India are on track to surpass the total number of pets in the U.S. So that gives you an idea of the sheer challenge. So what we're probably looking at over the next couple of decades is a billion more hungry mouths. In this case, the hungry mouths are our dogs and our cats. And no one's talking about that. How are we going to feed them? We all know we're going to have a problem feeding the world enough protein, but no one's talking about our pets. And so, you know, if you're going to add another 3 billion people to this planet over the next couple of decades, we're going to add another billion dogs and cats minimum. In India, the pet market is growing 20% year on year. China is very similar, about 20% from per year. And actually, this year, China should surpass the total number of dogs that the U.S. has. So soon, the U.S. will not be the biggest market for pet food in terms of sheer number of dogs. Market size will take a little while longer to catch up. The total market right now globally is $90 billion, and we need better, more sustainable solutions, right? So in the U.S., about 25 to 30% of the animals that are factory farmed are fed to our pets, to our dogs and cats. It's just a crazy, crazy thing. So to me, I am a fan of the secrets that are hidden in plain sight. You know, I think it's really important for us to look at things that we have accepted as just truths that are actually not truths. There is no reason why our pets have to have animal protein versus a high quality plant protein or fungi slash yeast based protein. There's no fundamental reason. It's the same amino acids. There's not something magical about animal protein versus plant protein. And so that began my mission about three years ago. We're now, Wild Earth is now the leading plant based vegetarian dog food in the US. We will soon be launching in India. I don't have the exact date yet, but when I say soon, by the time this podcast is probably out, Your listeners are probably waiting just a couple of weeks, short weeks. So please sign up to the Wild Earth email list and uh, follow us on social at Wild Earth Pets. We will be launching in India. Uh, We have, honestly, I would say the most incredible partner in India, Heads Up for Tails. And so, you know, we're really excited about the founder, Rishi, and, and her mission as well. And so we're coming. We're coming, you know, for one of the most incredible markets, which, you know, we think very much aligns with our mission in India. And so we think that we can transform not just the US, but also India and Asia in terms of plant-based products. It's a huge mission. A lot of people have asked me why pet food, even if you don't care about the factory farming or the environmental impact, if all you do is care about your pets and the health of your pets, repeatedly the US FDA has found contaminated meat uh, in US dog food, which has led to the recall of literally hundreds of millions of units of dog food, which has had euthanasia drug, which is toxic to animals, has killed both dogs and cats who have just literally eaten their food, either gotten very sick and had to go to the veterinarian or literally have died. Contaminations with plastics, all sorts of things, which are just terrible. Even if all you do is really care about the health of your pet, that's really our focus, right? So we want to transform pet food to be healthier for our pets. And by the way, there's additional advantages that it is sustainable and it's kinder for the animals and the planet as well. 
I mean, it's truly fascinating, Ryan. I think there's been so much more recognition over the last few years about exactly how much our food systems and not just, I guess, food systems for humans, but also food systems for pets and all food systems in general are breaking the planet. We've had this pact with the planet for the last decades where we've had this extractive relationship with nature, essentially. We can no longer continue to extract the way we've been extracting from nature. It makes no sense. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm super, super excited for, for your mission and, and how you're taking it forward with Wild Earth Pets. And obviously, we also have a shared mission more generally that does apply to humans, right? So when we talk yes. about GFI, our goal is using markets and technology, particularly in India, I would say, to go from scarcity to abundance. Because we're not yeah. going from a high consumption of meat and trying to reduce that over time. We're, in fact, going from scarcity of protein also for humans and trying to think about how we can supply an abundant supply of protein over the next decades without breaking the planet, as I said. So we need to feed, you know, 10 billion people, obviously, by 2050. A sixth of those are going to be in India. And the pathway might be very different because we're a low-income country. We're in Mm -hmm. countries that are low- and middle-income, like India, startups, the incubation ecosystem, everything's sort of embryonic, right? And we've talked about how Mm -hmm. frontier markets are particularly exciting to you right now relative Mm -hmm. to the advanced countries like the U.S. So what do you think is going to emerge over the next decades? Do you think there's going to be technology that's developed from the ground up? Is it going to be partnerships, technology transfer, knowledge transfer between various markets? Uh, And how do we all leverage food tech and biotech to feed ourselves? India in particular, and and we can definitely talk about other countries which are developing low to middle income. I'm actually probably most excited about Asia in particular, but you know, globally as well, Asia, Africa, Latin America, these are markets which I love because I think that they have so much potential and they have so much talent as well. India obviously had the green revolution. India has already been a pioneer in agricultural technology. And I know Varun, you and I have really talked about, and we'll, we'll probably go into further detail as well, just about the sheer variety of agriculture that's available within India and the varietals and the different types of foods that are currently available within India, which are available almost nowhere else on the planet. But one thing that India and actually many of the developing markets as well have is that there's incredible talent now. And so India in particular has a huge biotech industry already, primarily focused on making human therapeutics. But there's no reason why India cannot become one of the leaders, if not the leaders, in the future of food as well. One of the things that I love about biology is that it is an exponential technology. It is a technology that allows you to go from scarcity to abundance. I mean, you know, just the sheer concept of what biology does, photosynthesis. So, you know, all of the beautiful green crops and plants across the globe basically turn photonic energy from the sun. They take CO2 and water and make food for us. That's how we all, like every single living thing feeds itself on this planet other than plants that make their own food. That is incredible as a technology. If we think about it from a technological perspective, it is so much more advanced than any human technology. And, you know, we have reached this era where we can now engineer biotechnology, which is essentially alien technology, right? Aliens didn't come and give it to us. It exists around us. We are made of it. We're just now starting to understand it. It is true molecular nanotechnology. And so we can literally transform the world. And to me, there seems no fundamental reason why we can't have a much more sustainable world and remove scarcity and embrace abundance. There's no reason why anyone on this planet needs to not have clean water, abundant food, shelter, housing, clothing. All these things should literally cost cents, literally, you know, U.S. cents pennies, rupees, right? This is what I'm so excited about. And I think that sometimes, you know, when I talk about the future of food, people think that I'm only interested in food and I I really am not. I'm interested in every application of biotechnology to the human condition and also to the planetary condition of all of the animals on this planet as well, our fellow earthlings. Yeah. I mean, it's totally fascinating, Ryan. You mentioned uh, in that answer that We absolutely can look at different themes emerging from within these countries. So we talked about agri-technology in a place like India with all of this crop biodiversity that we have. We're seeing a lot of that emerge now. I mean, companies uh, in the food space obviously are looking at this. Companies in the biotechnology space are looking at manufacturing drugs using plants. And I think that we're definitely going to get to a point where we simply have not envisaged right now what it can do 
to be truly transformative. As you said, it's an exponential technology. Yeah. You mentioned also that India has a thriving biopharmaceutical sector, some of the largest manufacturers of drugs anywhere in the world. All of that infrastructure, that talent can be applied to this space. And then lastly, I did want to comment on the talent thing that you said. We've been running this smart protein innovation challenge where students and young people, entrepreneurs, young professionals apply and then they take all of our materials all together and then they have a chance to win prizes and submit business plans. We had 1,146 applications for this. It's amazing in terms of we're going to have a, a cohort of 500 people that are going to emerge from this and suddenly perhaps become viable early employees for companies or at least able to join some of these companies or found companies on their own as well. We do have to work on fundamental infrastructure challenges, get these people the tools that they need to succeed. But it's just incredibly exciting right now. Honestly, India has everything it needs, right? If you look at heavy representation of, you know, either Indian Americans or Native Indians that are leading technology companies, right? You know, Google, Microsoft, all of these are being led by Indians. And so, you know, there is a deep history and tradition of entrepreneurship and technology. And I think we're starting to see the world waking up that biology is a technology. Food is a technology. So as we start moving into this era, you know, we're going to see Asia really taking its place. You know, if you look at Asia as a piece of the world, it's about 30% of the world. And I think we're going to see at least 30% of the innovation, at least 30% of the unicorns. So unicorns are companies that are worth over a billion dollars that actually come from these regions, you know, whether it's India, whether it's China, whether it's the Philippines, whether it's Singapore, we're already starting to see the early evolution of these companies. I was very thankful to be able to back Shiok Meats. Shiok Meats is now the leader in cell-based meat in Singapore, led by Sandy and Kai Yi. It's incredible. And only like two years ago, I remember talking to investors in Singapore and across Asia going, oh, no, 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 we don't have the entrepreneurs that can do it. We don't have people that are driven enough. We don't have people that understand this. And it was just total nonsense. So, you know, one of the things that I, you know, for all of your listeners that are listening to this podcast is realize that the future looks very different when you look backwards rather than forwards. And what I mean by that is that instead of looking at where we are today, look in the next 10 years, place yourself, we're in 2020, place yourself in 2030, when, you know, basically most of the animal-based industries are going bankrupt. We have autonomous cars, we have, you know, biotechnology, we, we understand how to do all sorts of incredible things and look back and think about, the future that will be created. It's ridiculous to say that, you know, there won't be multiple, multiple billion dollar biotechnology companies, food companies, tech companies coming out of India, right? It would be ridiculous to think of that. So place yourself in that future and give yourself permission to start building today for that future. You know, give yourself permission. If someone tells you, and most, by the way, for most people who build anything interesting, the earliest days of whenever you're building something interesting, almost everyone tells you that it's a terrible idea, it'll never work, and who really wants that anyway? That is literally going to be your course if you decide to build something new. And when you start to succeed, then you'll have people actively attacking you and saying, this is terrible, it needs to be shut down. And then finally, when you win, then people are saying, well, they would always win. It was always known that they were going to win. It's literally the life cycle of great things being built. And so my advice for your listeners is, to give yourself permission, place yourself 10 years in the future, look back. What are you going to build that has a positive impact on the world and start building today? On that very positive note, we'll take a short break. Stay tuned for more with Ryan on Feeding 10 Billion. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another awesome week on the IBM Podcast Network. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IBM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Been a really fun week on the network. Please do definitely check out all the regular shows that you do. But in addition, let me give you a few recommendations. On Agla Station Adulthood, Ritasha and Ayushi talk siblings. Really fun episode. I think you'll enjoy that. Nishad by Vaidya is on Cyrus and they discuss, uh, hey, cricket and a lot of different things around cricket. I think you'll enjoy that as well. Old friend Parmesh Shahani, he was on Absolutely Right. Definitely do check that out. Tamal Mills was on Edges and Sledges, another episode which I've heard really good things about. I haven't heard it yet. I need to listen to that soon. And guys, Uncle Please Sit, definitely listen to that. They've been killing it. This week they have Abby Phillips. He's Dr talking about medical misinformation. Last week, Paramita Vora was talking about sex education and who needs it. They've been really coming. it. Definitely do check that out. And with that, let me get you back to your show. Welcome back. You're listening to Feeding 10 Billion. 
So Ryan, you were talking about how plants make energy from the sun, convert it into food for us, and it's really hard for us to create that. We couldn't if we tried. So there are many pathways to feeding 10 billion. Plant-based, mm-hmm. cell-based, cellular agriculture, acellular agriculture, fermentation. Are you partial to any of these? Do you believe that these will work in silos or in tandem to solve our problems? And what excites you the most? Is it the cutting edge aspect of technology or how it can be scaled to solve some of our biggest problems? You know, I think the question is a very interesting question, right? Because today we think of plant-based, cell-based, cultivated, fermented, recombinant as separate areas. Whereas to me, I view them all as technologies. And so I think that these technologies will be melded in really interesting ways. So I am actually very excited about the future because I believe we humanity have finally realized after 10,000 years, we have re-remembered that food is technology. And so, you know, there will be a version 1.0, version 2.0, version 3.0, version 500 of these new types of foods, and there will be constant innovation. So I think what we're going to see over the next decade is constant innovation. One of my favorite research reports is the Rethink X report. It's called Disrupting the Cow. I highly recommend it. It's a free report for all of your readers to read. Animal agriculture will essentially end because it will go bankrupt by 2035. This was predicted. This is based on the cost curve. This will happen. I'm certain it will happen. And I think 2035 is a pretty good estimate. What that basically means is even if the slaughterhouses want to remain open, or even if the dairies want to continue to remain open, we're already seeing this in the U.S., they're going bankrupt. As of last year, they started to go bankrupt because it's a low margin business, which is not sustainable. And for every billion dollars in revenue that drops, we're probably going to see several failed companies. And here's the interesting part. We're going to see several incredible ascendant companies that are going to become unicorns. And so last week, we essentially saw a new unicorn born, which was Oatly, the plant-based oat milk company, raised something like $200 million, and they're now worth $2 billion. That's plant-based oat milk. If you had told me that even two years ago that we would see that, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I, I just wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have believed the Ryan from the future who would have traveled back two years ago to tell the Ryan from the past, by the way, everything that goes plant-based, everything that goes recombinant, everything that goes cell-based, you're going to have multiple billion-dollar companies in every single category. I wouldn't have believed that. And now I'm certain of it. Like we, we're not going to see just one Memphis meets. We're going to see, you know, 20, 30, 50 Memphis meets. We're not going to see one Oatly. We're going to see 20 Oatleys. Um, yeah. This is the scale of the changes that are coming in front of us. And so I don't think it's as easy as any one sector. I think it's all of the above. And that's what I'm most excited. I'm most excited about these companies becoming commercial scalable businesses that have a very positive impact for all of our health in terms of the food that we consume, but then also, you know, the planet and the animals too, really shifts humanity away from, you know, I think what we will view as a prehistoric age where we, you know, we basically domesticated. The first domestication was the domestication of plants to make crops and animals to make farm animals. The second domestication is really cellular and molecular biology of food and understanding how it interacts with our body as well. So over time, you know, nutrition, you know, let food be thy medicine. That is true. And so over time, we will figure out better and better ways of making better and better food. And it will not require, you know, farmhouses and slaughterhouses. Totally agree. And I think um, one of the most exciting things about the Oatly deal you mentioned there, so it was celebrity investors like Oprah and Jay-Z and crucially, I think, Blackstone, which is just like the most grown up type investor you can think of, like big businesses on board, moving things forward. Blackstone CEO also wrote in his investor letter last year that ESG or sustainability is the theme for the future and it's happening right now, right? So I think when we start to think about these kinds of essentially grown-up themes, right, where technology is having an impact in society, one of the major things that obviously comes up is regulation. And we've talked about this before and Oftentimes, regulation is stifling to innovation. Obviously, it's set in place to protect consumers. So how do we think about navigating a regulatory environment in all of these new markets where if we don't get it right, then an India or an EU might be left behind in terms of the sustainability implications and all of the welfare implications? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, Varun. And I know that you and the team at the Good Food Institute are working really hard to make it happen. I mean, I would say that you and the team are probably one of the most powerful forces to help us, you know, do it correctly, do it right. You know, we are going to see certain regions and certain countries left behind. I mean, I actually think the EU is one of them. 
the EU is starting to fall behind when it comes to innovation, particularly around biotechnology, and it is embracing the plant-based movement. So I think that that's positive, but it really is not embracing biotechnology and food. And so I think that regions and countries are going to be left behind, you know, because they're just not embracing the future. And, and this happens, right? I mean, we've seen this, that there are certain countries that fall into essentially a technological dark age and certain regions that do. And so we might see that for Europe, while the US, Latin America, Africa, and Asia races ahead. And so, you know, in terms of, you know, regulatory infrastructures, I'm very excited by the way that, you know, some of the things that I've heard about India, potentially in terms of regulation, definitely Singapore. There are some places that it's going to be a hard fight, but it'll be a winnable fight in the US as an example. And across Latin America, there's very positive things being said by many of the politicians. So, and even in Africa, you know, we've seen some governments really starting to embrace biotechnology and food. And so that's a very promising sign. So I think that as a whole, the world is going to move very quickly to embrace these technologies. And there will be exceptions, unfortunately. So Ryan, finally, on this really breezy episode that has a lot of positive points for players in the Indian ecosystem to take away, the year is 2050. What will your average day look like? And what do you think we'll be feeding ourselves? I want an answer that maybe focuses on the non-scientific stuff as well, because we've been geeking out about the science of the product yeah. that you're making, right? So when you have to talk to a consumer mm -hmm. that maybe doesn't get all of this, how do you reach out to them? So in some ways, it will be totally transformed. In other ways, it'll actually be kind of familiar, right? You know, I was thinking about this question. You know, In 2050, I will be about 70 years old, 70. And I was thinking on who will I be then? You know, I've had the blessings of being able to back some incredible founders. I've had the blessings of being able to build some incredible things. I hope that in the next couple of decades, I'm able to continue to support people who are trying to transform the world in a positive way. And so I think that it will just be obvious by 2050, no one's going to have farms. You know, there's going to be no slaughterhouses. We will be thinking about entirely different things at that point. We will be thinking about how do you optimize nutrition? How do you extend human lifespan? I don't think it's crazy to think that the average human lifespan could be 120 years. Maybe at 70 years of age, I will be considered middle age at that point. You know, it'll be 70 will be the new 40. Yes. And it'll be just normal for us. It'll be normal. You, you'll have incredible brands. So I think consumer brands will never go away. You know, when you go to KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, you go to McDonald's, you go to Burger King or the equivalents, I'm sure we'll probably have different brands. Then Jolly Bees in the Philippines, you know, you will eat products that are tailored for different types of biology and none of it will come from slaughterhouses, even if it's meat. And I think we're, you know, we're going to have, you know, foods and experience. It'll just be so obvious. We'll look back on this period of time. It's like when we look back even a hundred years back and it's like, oh, people used to take horses around in the newspapers. When you look like about a hundred years back, even less than that, there were newspaper publications saying, how will we ever deal with the future? There's too much horse manure all over the streets. Literally, we will be flooded with horse manure and no one will be able to go anywhere. And it's a public health hazard. And this is the end of the world, right? And now it's a ludicrous thing to say, like horse manure as the end of the world scenario is just a ridiculous thing because we don't need horses. Same thing for feeding ourselves or for transportation or, you know, for fixing the human body, like it will be transformed. And so 2050 to me is an era where we really are thinking globally as a human species. Hopefully we can move past a lot of this nonsense that we're seeing from these isolationist governments that are, you know, talking about, you know, people from that particular country or that particular region. If you look in long time, which is my favorite thing to do, and what I mean by long time is evolutionary history, you look back 100,000 years and you see that actually we're all pretty much the same species and humanity has mixed for hundreds of thousands of years. And, and by the way, even deeper than that. So other hominids, not Homo sapiens, you know, Neanderthals, Denusians, some unknown species which are in our genomes, we mixed with all of them. And so I think the future of humanity is global. I hope that, you know, in 2050, we have the scenario where we can look at the United Federation of Planets and we can look up into the sky and go, huh, those people are from Earth. Those people are from Mars. Well, they're not that different. We're going to be looking at a very different, I think, solar system view as well. So we will be in space. We will have colonies. People in space will not be feeding themselves, you know, slaughterhouse 
animal products, they'll be feeding themselves engineered cell-based foods. So yeah, the future is vast and so exciting. I hope that at 70, it feels like middle age. I think it will, Ryan. I think it'll feel like middle age as you're charting a path across the solar system. So thank you, Ryan. It's always a pleasure to catch up with you. And I look forward to chatting with you again. Thank you, Varun. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Ramya. The smart protein transformation is taking place against the backdrop of breathtaking technology development. And this is especially true in the exciting world of biology. A recent report from McKinsey titled The Bio-Revolution highlights a confluence of breakthroughs in the biological sciences, along with the advancement of computing, automation, and artificial intelligence, which are fueling a new wave of innovation. These new biological applications are already improving our response to global challenges, including climate change and, of course, the current pandemic. Responses to COVID-19 have showcased the substantial advances made in biological science in just the past few years. The speed with which scientists sequenced the virus genome weeks rather than months was a testament to these advances. And that sequencing is just the start. Biological innovations are enabling the rapid introduction of clinical trials of vaccines, the search for effective therapies, and a deep investigation of both the origins and the transmission patterns of the virus. This kind of innovation has the potential to fast track everything from biomedical science, energy, materials production, and of course, agriculture. As these innovations radiate throughout society, smart protein champions like Ryan Bethencourt may be the ones building the future. And of course, their contributions will owe a great deal to the foundation of science, regulatory support, and capital, which other actors like governments, universities, and venture capital bring to the table. If countries like India don't want to be left behind, it's time for us to harness our tremendous potential to activate the new bio-revolution. And if you want to start a company in this space or are interested in just learning more about this sector as a researcher or want to collaborate, please do reach out. You can also join our GF Ideas India Smart Protein Innovation Community on LinkedIn or follow us on social media. We are Good Food India on Twitter and the Good Food Institute India on Instagram. And we leave all those URLs as well as the LinkedIn URL in our description. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM Network. You can listen to us on the IVM Podcast app or ivmpodcasts.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IVM Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I am at varund 7 on Twitter and at Varun5 on Instagram. You can come ask me why. And if you want to reach out to me, I'm Cryptic Caprice on Twitter and Dithering Phenambulist on Instagram. Please don't ask me why. We look forward to having you with us every week. And of course, if you'd like to be part of accelerating the future of our food system, please just get in touch. You can email us at india at gfi.org. My name is Varun Deshpande, Managing Director at the Good Food Institute India. And I'm Ramya Ramurthy, the Communication Specialist at the Good Food Institute India. And you have been a part of Feeding 10 Billion Season 2. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Pesa Pesa, a show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. robo advisory, startups, just name it, we've got it. At Pesa Pesa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday and you can listen to my show on the IVM Podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have. Advertising is dead. Yep, you heard me right. Advertising is dead. We're all in the content business now. Let's not call it news, TV, radio, etc, etc. It's all content and we're in the middle of this weirdly exciting phase where all the borders and lines that have been drawn over decades has been swept away by this lovely thing called the internet. We're a show where we don't dwell on just the stuff that is now, but rather the wider stuff about advertising, media, content and the whole goddamn circus surrounding it. Tune in every Tuesday for our weekly unboxing of the mystery box we used to call advertising. I'm Varun Dugirala, co-founder and content chief at The Glitch, and this is my new podcast, Advertising is Dead. <laughs>